Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our session today. We're going to be talking about education and the digital aspect of it. So I'm going to invite the convener, um, Lena, who's part of the Global Students Forum, to just give her welcome remarks. And then we're going to dive into our discussion. Again, welcome. It's nice to have all of you here. Let's have an engaging session. Lena, welcome. Thank you, Ms. Winnie. For, I want to um, welcome everyone here today. Um, distinguished moderator, speakers and participants, ladies and gentlemen, greetings to everyone. It gives me great pleasure to grace um, all of you are present in this interest in the interest of the Global Student um, Forum and tremendous uh, contentment to be presenting the welcome, the welcome speech. So before I begin um, this, before we begin this webinar on e-learning during the pandemic impacts and challenges in the drive for better learning space, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you who sincerely committed to making this event a success. This event would have been impossible without the support of each and every one of you present here. Webinars are organized to conduct, webinars are organized and conducted for the general audience to gain insights and information that will improve um, effective in their lives and work. The topic for, uh, for the discussion and debate today um, was chosen, keeping in mind the interests of youth, students, and all stakeholders in quality education for all. Ideal, ideally, it makes sense to tell people who they are listening to today. So dear participants and uh, our share, um, Dear viewers, um, I am going to hand over um, the moderation of this session to Ms. Winnie. Thank you very much, Lena. Once again, to our participants, our speakers, welcome to today's session. I'll be the moderator for the session. Good afternoon from Nairobi, Kenya. Winnie Nyandiga is my name. I work with 100 Million Campaign, which is a partner organization with Global Students Forum. So I'll give a small introduction. So here we go. We all know that in the face of the extraordinary circumstances created by the pandemic and to safeguard the right to education, public education needs to be re-strategized to allow it to accommodate these challenges and move ahead despite the obstacles, ensuring continuity in the best possible conditions and providing the same opportunities for students at every level and class in society. Education is a fundamental and universal human right that every society should do. Actually, no. Every society must do its best using every means possible to maintain. In a bid to maintain these rights, various governments and schools around the world have turned to technology and virtual learning techniques, which include the use of tools like television sets, radio here in Kenya, I don't know about your country. In Kenya, radio is widely used. We've seen the use of smartphones, laptops, et cetera, et cetera. According to the International Commission of the Futures of Education in 2020 and UNESCO, the renewal of education, human interaction, and well-being must be given priority. Technology particularly digital technology that enables communication, collaboration, and learning across distances is a formidable tool and not a panacea, but a source of innovation and expanded potential. Online learning has been shown to boost information retention. We will get into that, right? That online learning has been shown to boost information retention among students in a short amount of time. However, despite the scientific and technological progress in the world today, some countries are still lagging behind in technology 
and the quality of their education systems. Tell us in the chat if your country is one of the countries that is lagging behind in technology and the quality of education systems. In such countries, a very high number of children still do not have access to education, much less quality education. The appearance of COVID-19 in the picture only makes things worse. And we all know this, we have lived this. Most of us here are students and we have faced these challenges, right? So um, what we've seen again, the appearance of COVID in the picture has made things worse with long periods of confinement and uh, increasing number of deaths, which in turn severely affect the environment, causing the increment of poverty and wastage of resources. I know this is something that all of us in this meeting today can relate to. So let me turn to the panel today. We have an amazing panel and I'm going to do a short introduction. No, I'm not going to do the introduction. We want to hear from our panel. So I'm going to give each of our panel one minute for you to introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and what um, you're doing. So I will turn um, to the first one. Dr. Are you in the chat? We have Dr. Osei from Ghana. Over to you. Kindly introduce yourself one minute. Thank you, Winnie. And I'm happy to be part of this forum. I'm Dr. Kofi Osef Impon, a senior lecturer in marketing, University of Professional Studies, Accra in Ghana, and I'm currently the doctoral studies coordinator. And um, as a result of the pandemic, we are all now have to adjust and adopt the new learning system, which is mainly online. And so we've learned quite a lot from what we did not already know. Uh, as part of our teaching um, approach. So I'm here to also share my experiences. I know it's going to be a very successful forum. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome, Dr. Kofi. It's nice to have you. Ellen Dixon, over to you. Kindly introduce yourself one minute. Thank you for that, Wani. Uh, tēnā koutou, everyone. Uh, ko Ellen Dixon tōko ingoa. That is te reo Māori, which is the indigenous language of Aotearoa, New Zealand. It is me saying greetings to you. Firstly, I'd like to say a big thank you to Lena, Wani, Daniel, and everyone else who has organised this event. It is fantastic to be here and be chatting with you here today. Um, I am one of the members of the Global Student Forum Steering Committee, and I am also on the New Zealand Union of Students Associations. So we do not have a regional body in the Pacific, which is where I live, on an island um, at the bottom of the world. Instead, we have a lot of national representatives who we work between ourselves. I am a doctoral scholar at the moment, particularly working in an area called biopolitical sovereignty. So the digital world is of great interest to me, and I really look forward to hearing all of our conversation today. Thank you so much for having me. And I turn back over to Winnie. Welcome, Ellen, to our last speaker um, of the day, Juliet Humalo. Kindly introduce yourself one minute. Thank you, Winnie, and hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Juliet Saban Humalo. I'm from Lesotho, and I serve as a Deputy Secretary General, Deputy Secretary General at, in ASU, and also serve as a member of the Treasury Planning Committee. I'm very happy to be here and thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much, Juliet. And kindly receive um, apologies from Professor Remus, who unfortunately couldn't um, join us because of uh, confusion around time. Also to the participants, kindly introduce yourself in the chat because this is going to be an engaging session and we're going, we going to speak with each other. Right. So again, welcome very much. So setting the stage, I'm going to ask one general question and then I'm going to give each moderator two minutes to respond um, to the question. So um, Dr. Ose, because you are first, um, given the global vaccine campaign for everyone to be vaccinated and to ensure a safe return to normal, to normal, because we are all talking about going back to normal, what are the strategies? that are being put, and I also want to turn it, what are the strategies again that should be put to ensure a safe return to school? I'll go again. Given the global vaccine campaign for everyone to be vaccinated to ensure a safe return to normal, 
what are the strategies that have been put and should be put in place to ensure a safe return to school? Okay, thank you, Winnie. Um, I think um, a lot has been done in the area of campaigning to encourage members to be vaccinated so that at least we'll be able to contain the spread of the, of the virus. Um, as institutions, for instance, where I work at the University of Professional Studies at Cry in Ghana, we also uh, motivate our students to encourage, by encouraging them to take the vaccine, uh, though we know quite a number of them have not done it. But as a university, what we did was to um, organize um, the healthcare practitioners or uh, the community health people to come over to vaccinate our students, um, even before, um, uh, just after the, the, the lockdown. So we have also put in place measures to ensure that um, our students um, uh, get vaccinated and they are all um, in terms of the spread that they can be studying. That Yes, we are also putting in place steps or measures to ensure the containment of the spread of the virus. Um, again, we continue to encourage them and remind them of the protocols, um, what they need to observe, uh, be there for one another to be each other's keeper. Um, so we all have to protect ourselves, wearing the nose masks, ensuring that we sanitize our hands and all that. So that is something that as, as an institution, we also contribute to, to the country or to, to, to the um, World Health uh, plans or approaches in containing the spread of the, of the virus. Now that they are returning to school, um, we continue to ensure that um, this, um, we, we, we ensure that the protocols are well kept and they are observed to ensure that any time there is a symptom, someone reports of a symptom, we also take measures to isolate the person um, so that we don't get um, the spread going on through the students. Uh, it's something that is not that easy, but as an investor, we are doing our best. And so we have also instituted measures in, in, our, in our way of delivery. So for instance, um, we do a blended approach where we have both the online as well as the distribution for the on-site uh, delivery. At least this one has helped us to reduce the numbers on campus because where there's crowd, then the spread is also imminent. So we have instituted um, the blended approach where at a point some are off campus and then some are uh, in campus and um, taking their, their, their courses or receiving lectures. So as, as a university, we have also ensured that we continue to create the awareness encouraging people or members of the community to, to be mindful of what is happening around us uh, so that we don't go and contract it somewhere and then bring it to infect others. And again, in our lecture rooms, uh, what we did was to um, disinfect the whole campus and the lecture halls to ensure that at least the place is clean, the place is secured and ready for use. And then also ensuring that there's good ventilation um, coming in um, so that at least students will have that sound mind um, when, when, when lectures are ongoing because the environment is also very important. And in this pandemic, um, there are fears. People are scared. Um, we are not sure of who, who is sitting close to you, whether He's got it or not, and especially now that the new variant has come, that sometimes the symptoms are not even clear. You may not even see the symptoms, and yet um, the person may have may be having the virus. So, as an university, we are mindful of that. We keep encouraging them. There are signs, there are messages all over the place um, to keep um, reminding students of what they have to do. And then, as part of our contribution. Um, we also looking at ways of reducing uh, the numbers on campus at any given time. And that is where we have instituted the blended approach. And that also goes to us as the um, lecturers who are delivering for us to also be trained. We have to formulate um, or come out with a framework that will help us 
um, guide the delivery approach. So yes, we are, we are doing our best, uh, encouraging our students to, to get vaccinated and then ensuring that we are all secured and we are safe. Thank you so much, Dr. Osei. Ellen, over to you. Again, just for you to tackle um, the same question um, in two minutes, and I'm going just to repeat it for you, that given the global vaccine campaign for everyone to be vaccinated, to ensure a safe return to normal, what are the strategies that are being put in place or that should be put in place to ensure a safe return to school? Participants, tell us in the chat if you're vaccinated as you introduce yourself and where you're from. <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Winnie. In the Pacific, we have a very, very unique way of trying to get students to vaccinate themselves before they come back on campus, and it's called vaccination carnivals. I am not crazy. This is what we do. Um, in our communitarian culture, it's very common for us to all want to get together to celebrate, which obviously cannot happen within the pandemic environment. It's also traditional to bring food and share it with your community. As a consequence, one of the strategies has been that campuses and school areas uh, serve as a, a place where we can come share food and support each other through vaccination carnivals with music, with live dancing. Um, our Minister of Health was actually seen dancing at one of these and some of the students recorded him and it went all over Twitter. Um, so I think it's having the human side uh, to vaccination, which is so important during the pandemic. Um, but in addition to that, also speaking to some other physical safeties that are very key, I think at this time in a safe return to schools, is actually ensuring that there is easy accessibility to basic hygiene supplies, such as soap, um, masks, hand washing stations, and contributing to these with education campaigns to combat against misinformation that may tell different stories. In addition to that, um, having really strong infrastructure that can come in and, and support this process with clearer local, regional, federal, national policies and guidance on the ground so that there can be real integration of funding models that can then support school sites and campuses being a place where these things can take place. In addition to that, I think there's also an important emotional factor where schools and campuses serve quite importantly um, in aiding the conversation around what a pandemic environment is, what the, well, maybe not normal, as what he said, but maybe you know that we're going to end up in, um, given when we're in a, a learning crisis, unfortunately, as it's been called by the UN that we are currently in, um, schools now serve as a conversation space where we hold dialogues about the grief of the loss of loved ones, the fear of crisis situations. One of the things I've been noticing secondary schools have been doing is creating posters on their stories of encountering the pandemic, their stories of encountering vaccinations. Um, and also the school then becomes a wider sort of social nexus for talking social about screening processes. Okay. Oh, got some feedback on myself. <laughs> uh, screening processes for physical health and well-being, but also asking bigger questions concerning school nutrition and um, helping out with household income because, you know, the pandemic has not just affected the educational component, but also the welfare component of our lives. But I think it's also caused us to rethink the way that we engage with, say, outdoor spaces as well, because we can get so caught up in our digital environments that we're also rethinking how do we space out classrooms? What does that look like um, when we are distancing ourselves from each other or when we're wearing a mask and we can't physically connect with each other in the same way. Um, and then on top of that, we have the dynamics of not just dealing with the student elements in this, but also the staff well-being in this. It's a sort of a joint process. Some of the really cool things that I've seen is that policy and institutional changes actually have considered these human factors. And one of those significant areas has been in our region seeing changes to university entrance because we've actually seen uh, a mindfulness within our policymakers that um, crisis does affect people on a very personal level as well as a national collective level as well as a global level. And implementing this in policy is really, really key in order to make school not just a safe space for us to be able to engage one-on-one -on -one or collectively, but also a place for the conversation as to what does the future of education look like in this context. Thanks for that. Thank you so much, Ellen. Juliet, what are the strategies? What is Lesotho doing? What is the continent doing to ensure a safe return to school? Thank you, Winnie. Uh, we saw closure of schools caused by COVID-19 exacerbating the previously 
who are already at the risk of being excluded from quality education be most affected by the pandemic. And now with the existence of the vaccination, we are seeing governments and development agencies putting forward strategies to ensure safe return to schools. And some of the strategies include a vaccination of educators. On 14th December 2020, UNESCO and Education International urged countries including to include teachers as priority group in national vaccination rollout plans to, to curb the spread of COVID-19 and to protect teachers and students in an effort to ensure the continuation of learning and a safe return to in-person teaching. And I think we can all agree that protection of educators is essential for schools to reopen safely. And we saw some countries uh, allocating teachers to the first priority group, other to the second priority group. And in some countries, they were not prioritized at all. And this was the case for almost one out of two countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we saw that the countries that allocated teachers to the first priority group with the French line workers have very, very high proportions of primary and second, have vaccinated very high proportions of primary and secondary teachers. And so for instance, if we look at Morocco, they have vaccinated 99% of primary and secondary school teachers as of 16th September 2021. And I think we can all agree that with the 99% of the teachers vaccinated, students are going to fall safe and teachers are going to fall safe at school. And some countries, most countries in Africa, they allocated uh, teachers to the second priority group. And this resulted in low vaccination rates in countries such as Uganda, where we saw 32% uh, of primary and secondary teachers vaccinated as of 17 December 2021. And we know one of the challenges that we have in Africa is the slow vaccination rollout plan. Hence why we have such low statistics. And uh, in Lesotho, one of, the, one of the programs that we have to ensure safe return to school is the WASH program. And so a number of schools have permanent hand washing stations installed and is provided and water is made available either through water systems and piping in rural areas where they, there's no water and a provision of water tracking. And so the schools have been equipped with minimum hygiene standards for prevention of COVID-19. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Juliet. Um, I feel like from um, this question, uh, the area around health and uh, vaccination and just pushing students and teachers, prioritizing them to be vaccinated, infrastructure, and even social welfare are some of the strategies that we have seen um, our government, our decision makers put into place to ensure a safe return to school. Dr. Ose, I want to come back to you. And I want us to tackle on quality education. We have talked about going back to school. But apart from just going back to school, what are the measures that have been put in place to maintain quality education? Just okay. not just education, but quality education during the pandemic and post pandemic, especially when we are facing the hybrid um, kind of teaching. But what, what measures? are we putting in place to maintain quality education? Thank you. Um, yes, quality education is key here, especially uh, where during the pandemic, uh, most of the institutions, especially in Africa and Ghana, who were originally not used to this online deliveries are now moving from on-site to online uh, modalities of delivering education. And oftentimes when it happens like that, we realize that the even the students, the students effort that they put in as well as the delivery uh, student performance over the few uh, months of adopting the online in our part of the world uh, had some challenges in terms of uh, the output, in terms of the quality that really came out as uh, reflected in their um, performance. And of course, we noticed that um, some of the students would 
let's take the online delivery, for instance, where some of the students will just um, sign up. So they are there, but they are not there. And so um, they, you see their list, their names in the list of uh, attendees, but then you call their names and they are not there. So they don't really follow uh, the lecture. But what we have done is to put in place um, in terms of building our uh, technological infrastructure, because now whether we like it or not, that is the way to go. Uh, build our infra uh, technological infrastructure to enable both students and um, lecturers or teachers to adapt due, this new way of delivery. And um, as I said earlier, ensuring that there's that quality, uh, we have resorted to the hybrid approach because we realized that going online only uh, could create some challenges or problems where sometimes the lack of faculty interaction could affect uh, students' uh, motivation. Um, also, the, uh, the, there's this kind of low academic motivation because, because people don't get to interact among themselves, among the students and the lecturers as well. And so that actually um, is something that could lower uh, the quality of education and even um, those uh, that we uh, churn out in terms of the products or the graduates that um, we churn out as an university. And so in order to deliver or produce students who have the requirements and who meet the labor market demands in terms of quality, um, we have put in place measures to uh, motivate um, students uh, by even giving um, highly subsidized um, data, that data, data price uh, costs are subsidized through our engagement uh, or, or collaboration with some of the uh, service providers. Um, so that students will be able to uh, join and enjoy the full length of the lecture. And we know the technological challenges here in Africa where um, the, the network is not stable. And so in the course of the lecture, students lose out and they are not able to even participate in the remaining uh, hours of the, of the class. So switching from the traditional to Dr. Say, we are losing you. Can you check your connection? Okay, as we wait for Dr. Say to work on his connection, I know he has really touched on building and strengthening technological infrastructure and actually using incentives to motivate students to be able to attend the um, classes so that to ensure that they get what it is they are being taught. So I want us to tackle um, on issues, equity and uh, inclusion, especially during the pandemic. And I want to turn to you, Ellen. So um, what we've seen is that due to schools, um, due to school closure, sorry, caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, students from diverse backgrounds are likely receiving less support and extra services they require. The gap between students who face additional barriers and those who do not, um, who do not may have widened. How can schools and universities ensure equity and inclusion, especially during the pandemic and post-pandemic? Did you get the question? Yes, I did. Thank you for that. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, one of the things I'd want to first point out is that even in the pre-pandemic world, the issues of equity and inclusion were already very, very off course from the achievement of SDG 4 in the way that it was envisioned in the first place, unfortunately, and that was reflected in the level of investment that we already saw a lot of governments doing towards the education sector. Um, also, I also think we can't underestimate the impact that the um, privatised structure has had on the digital environment even pre-pandemic and how the move to sort of flexible study plans as people were taking on um, more employment options to deal with fluctuating economic levels has um, seen a rise in um, what are called MOOCs, 
uh, massive open online courses, uh, the concept of micro credentials, which are stackable in order to create new versions of degrees, which really freaks academics out at the moment, um, and industry based certificates. So we're seeing a, kind of a bit of a revolution as to the way that we go about education. And there are multiple equity issues in that because a lot of those um, are already in privatized structures. So we were already heading in that direction pre pandemic. And then with the, the hitting of COVID-19 um, meant that a lot of these um, situations where equity um, and inclusion became a, a key concern were really exacerbated. And we already all know what some of those elements were, uh, the disruption through vulnerability to physical illness, poor child protection in terms of sexual or gender-based violence, um, exploitive child or student labor, um, and in some cases, vulnerability to human trafficking um, are just some of the realities of the encounters that the pandemic has brought about. And from that, we can see that the school itself or the campus is actually the, the front line of equity and inclusion issues. It's where a lot of those conversations take place. It, as we've already pointed out, those welfare supports are really key there. It can be for some that they lost access to a regular meal. Um, some were using that space to deal with housing overcrowdedness or homelessness, or in some cases, dealing with the context of the digital divide. So we cannot underestimate how important that is in actually building from it. But in ensuring equity and inclusion uh, during and beyond the pandemic, uh, we have to be in a context where we're able to build those holistic communities um, where we can facilitate conversations between education providers, teachers or lecturers, facilitators, administrators, social support services, economic and welfare engagement, on both like a horizontal level, but also a vertical level. If we're not having policy that's been created or if we've only got grassroots initiatives, we need that intersection between the two. Uh, and that also includes setting up clear communication channels, such as the ability to target particular audiences um, and include students in particular in participatory practice, you know, getting them to contribute to what the curriculum looks like. What does pedagogical structure look like when you're in that environment? We've got a large number of, you know, minority cultures. We've got international students who may be studying from a different place. You've got disabled students. You've got um, students who have certain religious orientations or cultural preferences. And as a consequence, you need to have those voices at the table when you're making decisions because it will impact the way they can engage. It could even be as simple as, for example, I know online invigilation for many people was very complicated complicated because uh, for those who have um, some neurodiversity, uh, the actual flashing lights or the process of data collection was difficult for them in that context. It made them feel like they couldn't engage. We also need that financial incentive for study to ensure that people who are in that circumstance are not seeking alternative ways of being able to finance themselves to look after, say, family or friends um, and adding to equity issues and imbalances there where the preference is to be working over studying. If it's a choice between feeding yourself and it's a choice between studying, we're in kind of a learning deficit already. Um, we can't have a, a social structure that's focused on that because otherwise it will be able to... Um, undermine our, our equity in learning. But also there is like a lot of conversations that needs to be had about the double-edged sword of having a digital environment that can open up opportunities, but may not be easily accessible for a lot of people. Uh, the sort of bring your own device is now presumed to be normalized, but there are a lot of people who do not fit in that category, who don't have access to that content. In addition to that, um, there is huge equitable issues and ethical issues regarding the collection of student bio data and biometrics online um, and the use of technologies that are actually storing these data, this data permanently. And we've seen a lot of that, which came out of the US um, in the UK and some of those other places who are using online invigilation. In addition to that, I think we can't underestimate the impact that it has on uh, mental health and well-being, that um, there, it becomes a bit of a taboo topic to talk about that I don't feel like I'm being supported in my educational studies. And that also opens up their equitable issues um, because how can you feel included if you already feel, as has already been stated, that you can't engage in your community because you may be dealing with online technology or you may not be able to participate because of self-isolation or dealing with the pandemic. Um, in those types of contexts, for example, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, there is a preference, a cultural preference to deal face to face, which is why we have things like vaccination carnivals. Um, but when that can't happen, it changes dynamics, particularly for our Indigenous peoples and our 
First Nations peoples, um, we have the context of uh, when we're not face to face, we lose the energy of dealing with that person and that's considered culturally significant. Um, so we have to now create new processes. We have to talk to wider communities so we are able to establish mm -hmm. what is it to have people in this context? What do you need in order to feel included? Thanks for that, Winnie. Thank you so much, Ellen. I like when you speak um, on social welfare, you know, students' participation in how things should really be done. There can't be that gap that the government is deciding, but let's say teachers and students are really not um, included on how we can strengthen it. So I really like that. I'm um, coming back to you, um, Dr. Kofi, but first let me go to Juliet because I also want her to touch on um, inclusion and equity. I say that simply because um, uh, we have shocking statistics that Africa now is home to more child laborers than the rest of the world combined. And I mean, when I talk of child labor, it means that we have children out of school, right? But it's, it's crazy. We have more children out of school than the rest of the world combined. Juliet, as an African student leader, because you are a student leader in your country, and also both continentally at the All African Students Union. Under you, what is the ASU doing, right, to ensure and support, to ensure that vulnerable students learning in the pandemic, and even post-pandemic, but we're still in the pandemic, right? Um, what, may, what, what is ASU doing to support these vulnerable students, vulnerable learners? And what measures do you think need to be taken by government governments, our governments, to ensure equity and inclusion. Uh, thank you, Mimi. Thank, thank you. you. ASA continues to utilize its resources and influence to ensure that African students are aware of the opportunities to continue studying during the COVID-19. And we firmly continue to urge decision makers to ensure that education is accessible so that no student is left behind. And we have several programs aimed at ensuring inclusive education during the pandemic and post the pandemic. And one of those programs is the digital inclusion campaign. I think we all know that although the digital divide is a global pro problem, it is more pronounced in Africa. And so the aim of the digital inclusion campaign is to strengthen the technical capacity of student leaders in the Southern and Central Africa to organize and advocate for students' digital and educational rights. As through this project, students will be, student leaders will be equipped with relevant skills to actively engage with relevant government ministries, internet service providers, and mobile telecommunications network operators on the rights to access education in the backdrop of online learning. And this project is, is, in, is fully as funded by Open Society Initiative for South and Africa and is being implemented, currently being implemented in 11 countries in the South and Africa region, I ask. And another program that we have is the Education Enrollment Program which is an initiative of All African Students Union and is basically towards, it's geared towards a, getting every child into school. This project is in partnership with 100 Campaign, which is an organization committed to ensuring that every child is free, safe and educated. And this program is ethical as the concerns and it reflects our commitment to democratization of education everywhere on African continent. Uh, it was launched in 2019 and has two dimensions to it. So it's the child support dimension and the institutional support dimension. At the end of this project, we hope to ensure that children are in school and are actually learning given uh, the right tools and the right learning environment. And with regards to the measures that should be taken by the government to ensure equity and inclusion uh, during the pandemic and post the pandemic. Uh, Ellen has already highlighted, highlighted on a few of the equity measures that are crucial in our society. And I'm just gonna look at it from the perspective of the gender disparity, because we can all agree that while technology is a useful tool for supporting e-learning, uh, it risks intensifying the existing learning disparities 
especially considering the gender differences in ownership and access to digital devices. I read a shocking state uh, from UNICEF, UNICEF that women in low, middle, low and middle income countries, which is where most of our African countries are, are less likely, are 8% less likely than men to own a mobile phone. And 20% are less likely to use a, the mobile phone to access the internet. And in 2018, the Vodafone Foundation found that boys are 1.5 times more likely than girls to own a phone. And I think we can all agree that the impact of this is that the disadvantaged girls would be more negatively affected by e-learning than boys, hence was, uh, reversing the decades of progress that have been made towards uh, the gender inequality. And therefore governments should transform how they reach out of school girls and boys, even after the pandemic is over. And they should do this by designing and scaling remote learning programs using appropriate and affordable technology. And this project should take the gender forecast lens so that the design and deployment will be especially sensitive for girls to address uh, the gender disparities gaps that we have. And the safety and violence risks that could be posed to girls in participation of remote learning must be identified and protection approaches must be incorporated into the strategies of measures that government will take. And this should include a digital safeguarding flows that uh, we usually have on an online platform. And uh, back to school campaigns must include targeted messages for communities and caregivers to actively engage in supporting girls to go back to school, including uh, pregnant girls. Because in Lesotho, we saw high statistics of pregnant girls, early and forced marriage during the pandemic. So these girls, these girls must be uh, encouraged to go back to schools to school and messages that are being pushed by the government should be culturally relevant and effective at changing the persistent and harmful gender norms that normally hold girls back. And lastly, we have heard a Ebola, Ebola, uh, I don't know, it was Ebola epidemic, not pandemic. And lessons from, from previous pandemics such as Ebola could help us as a way forward. What I'm saying is that research has to be conducted on the impact of that of the pandemic and the Ebola epidemic on educational outcomes in Africa. And we should also conduct research on the coping mechanism, mechanisms that we have adopted. And how this will help us it is that it will uh, provide evidence for policymakers in educational sectors in, in our countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juliet. I like when you passionately speak um, on the need uh, for us to, rather for governments and even us, yes, working in conjunction uh, to focus, rather to look at gender forecast lens when we look at um, inclusion and equity, especially when it comes to education. And uh, they're highlighting how girls are left behind, especially because of the pandemic. And even with that, I know last year there was a campaign um, with ASU again and um, in conjunction, rather in partnership with UNESCO, and 100 million was also involved on girls back to school. So very good work to ASU and what um, you are doing in the continent for vulnerable students and learners. Dr. Kofi, I want to come back to you because um, unfortunately, digital divide <laughs> and we had to cut this down. But I want to give you one minute for you to finish on how um, we can ensure quality education, whether what you're doing to ensure quality education, not just education, but quality education. Okay, thank you, Winnie. And sorry for my uh, technological challenge, uh, technology in a third world country. Um, so, um, in providing a holistic education where emphasis is on quality, um, institutions or as a country, we are focusing on 
um, from the economic perspective, that shows that future of the investors would clearly be shaped by the labor market needs. And so the question is, what kind of competencies or skills um, that the students must acquire in order to succeed in the labor market? And that is the focus. And so motivating students to acquire these relevant skills or requisite knowledge and competencies to prepare them um, um, for the labor market in all fields of practice. And most importantly, looking at technology and the digital, digitization, um, which has become a focal point um, that firms and um, institutions of higher learning, for instance, must focus. So these are likely to create new forms of learning and environments for learning. In the end, it's about the motivation that the students have um, in participating in the, in the learning process and putting in all their best and efforts to ensure that the, what they have been taught or what they learn actually uh, make, um, make meaning or sense to them and impact on society. So it's about what we invest, uh, institutions investing into technology, um, collaborating with internet service providers to provide some subsidized prices for our students so that they will always have access to the learning materials and, uh, and of course, participate in online learning, uh, whether um, during the lecture period or using the online learning ma management systems. So we as a, an institution of higher learning ensure that these are well, um, these are provided and our students are also um, empowered and they are resourced to assess quality education. Thank you so much, Dr. Osei. Our participants, any questions from you? Do you have any questions to the speakers today? Do you have any contributions? I want to take three contributions from the audience. Bismarck, one minute. Hi, Winnie. Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity. And thank you, uh, panelists, for such apt uh, presentations. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Kofi. Say, uh, I was formerly in his school, so um, I'm glad to see you, Doc. I'm currently in your sister organization, uh, University of Ghana. Uh, okay. Last year, uh, at the University of Ghana, for instance, um, we had online lessons for a full year. <laughs> and it was very flexible. A couple of my colleagues were very excited about it because they got the opportunity to work in school as well, make some money while they were, they were in school. And this year, we are told that uh, we the school management had decided that we students should come for site lessons. The reason being that the academic performance was not too good. Um, my question simply is, do you think given the influx of the technology and online learning, universities should redefine their goals and not focus too much perhaps on uh, the academic performance However, students should uh, they should be more focus on skills that they will need, which they are already exhibiting uh, from their workplaces, especially given the context of Africa where uh, uh, unemployment is on the rise. Do you think universities should redefine their goals and maybe perhaps put the current performance second and grade um, on site? a practical lesson from uh, workplace for entrepreneurship first. Thank you. Winnie, can I respond? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bismarck. Um, yes, it comes back to reforms. Uh, when I talked about the hybrid system, um, there's a need to for us to also have a new framework that will guide the delivery approach and that um, assessing the students' performance should not only be solely attributed to their performance at the end of semester exams. Unfortunately, in most of the institutions, that is where, um, that, that, that is where most of the marks uh, come from, your performance at the end of semester exams. For instance, in my institution, 60%, which I think is wrong. Um, especially and even at the graduate level, 
um, the percentage of score or grade from the end of semester exams should at least be maybe 30, 20 percent, because assessing the students should be an ongoing uh, process right from day one when the semester begins and not really um, waiting to the end of a um, semester where the, the, the student is examined. And then that, that uh, reflects the student's uh, performance. As I said earlier, um, our focus should be on um, producing graduates or products with that requisite knowledge and skills needed to shape and uh, needed by the labor market. And so universities or the future of universities should be clearly shaped by the labor market needs. And so embarking in activities that will resource the students like field trips, uh, practitioner forum, et cetera, as part of the delivery will really help the student to build their skills, even those who are not working. And so emphasis should not only be placed on the end of semester exams, but to me, we, we have to go back and then reframe or come out with a new framework uh, that will give more scores to the students' developmental stages from the day one of the semester to the very end of the semester. Thank you so much, Bismarck and Dr. Osei. Any other question from the participants? Share with us, I'll give you one minute. Share with us kindly, how has um, digital teaching and learning in the pandemic been for you as a student, as a tutor, as a teacher? How has it been for you? Any questions to our amazing speakers today? Okay. If there are no questions and contributions, allow me to take this opportunity. Is there someone trying to say something? Mariam? Okay. Thank you so much to our speakers, Dr. Osei, Ellen, and Juliet for giving us, um, um, rather for making time to be here today and share with us on uh, the important themes that we have touched on, that is on quality education. We've also touched on equity and inclusion, which are very necessary, especially during this time seeing how education has been largely affected by the pandemic. And now more than ever, um, we are at risk of losing a generation and leaving a generation behind of, because of how access to education has been difficult. I like when Ellen said it's a double sword. On one side, it is full of opportunities. I mean, we are digital natives. We are able to be here today from different countries and have this meeting. But on this other end, there are challenges of um, access, there is the challenge of um, quality because it's, it's just now education. How do we ensure it is actually of quality and it actually um, prepares our learners and students for future? So thank you once again for making time. Thank you to Global Students Forum for convening this, and a very much thank you again to you participants for making time to be here with us today. Have a good afternoon, good morning, good evening from wherever you are, and let's keep the conversation going. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.